Calpurnia. Be so. Caesar speaks. Calpurnia. Here, my lord. Stand you directly in Antonius' way when he doth run his course. Antonius. Caesar, my lord. Forget not in your speed, Antonius, to touch Calpurnia. For our elders say the baron, touched in this holy chase, shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember when Caesar says do this, it is performed. Set on and leave no ceremony out. <laughs> Caesar! Huh? Who calls? Bid every noise be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music, cries Caesar. Speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What says thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. <laughs> he is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. Caesar, Antony, and their companions leave for the games. Cassius and Brutus remain behind. Will you go see the order of the course, Brutus? Not I, Cassius. I pray you do. I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder, Cassius, your desires. I leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviours. But let not, therefore, my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one, nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus, with himself at war, forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitation. What is the shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. Why do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it, sir. Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! I would not, Cassius, yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. Or let the gods so speed me as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self I had as lief not be, as live to be in awe such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once upon a raw and gusty day, the tribe chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow, and so indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius a wretched creature, and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but nod on him. Another general shout. I do believe these applauses are for some new honours that are heaped on Caesar. My man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. And we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonourable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? When could they say till now the talk of Rome that her wide walks encompassed but one man? Now is it Rome indeed, and room enough when there is in it but one only man. Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. 
That you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, I have some aim. How I have thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. For this present, I would not so, with love I might entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will, with patience, hear, and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions as this time is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done, and Caesar is returning. As they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what hath proceeded worthy note today. I will do so. Look you, Cassius. The angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden train. Calpurnia's cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital, being crossed in conference by some senators. Casca will tell us what the matter is. Antonius. Caesar. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such a sleeper nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He is a noble Roman and well-given. Would he were fatter. But I fear him not. Yet, if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. He reads much. He is a great observer. And he looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. <laughs> such men as he be never at heart's ease, whilst they behold a greater than themselves. And therefore are they very dangerous. <laughs> I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear, for always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf, and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. <laughs> me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? I, Casca. Tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, you were with him, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what had chanced. Why, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus, and then the people fell a-shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that, too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that, too. Was the crown offered him thrice? Aye, marry wast. And he put it by thrice, every time gentler than other. And at every putting by, mine honest neighbours shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I am promised for. Will you dine with me tomorrow? I, if I be alive, and your mind hold, and your dinner worth the eating. Good. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. What a blunt fellow is this grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. So is he now, in execution of any bold or noble enterprise, however he puts on this tardy form. This rudeness is a source to his good wit, which gives men stomach to digest his words with better appetite. And so it is. For this time, I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you. Or if you will, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble. Yet I see thy honourable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humour me. I will this night in several hands in at his windows throw, as if they came from several citizens, writings all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat you, sure, for we will shake him or worse days endure. Brutus is troubled by the proposed conspiracy and spends a sleepless night. Mark Lucius, how? I cannot, by the progress of the stars, give guess how near today. Lucius, I say! I would it were my fault to sleep so soundly. When, Lucius, when? Awake, I say! What, Lucius? I called you, my lord. 
Go to the gate. Somebody knocks. Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council, and the state of a man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Sir, it is your brother Cassius at the door who does desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir, there are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir. Their hats are plucked about their ears and half their faces buried in their cloaks that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favour. Let them enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy, shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free? Oh, then by day where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none, conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability. For if thou put thy native semblance on, not Erebus itself were dim enough to hide thee from prevention. I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour, awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them. And no man here but honours you. And every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. This is Trebonius. Brutus. He is welcome hither. This Decius Brutus. Brutus. He is welcome too. This Casca. Brutus. This Sinner. Brutus. And this Metellus Simba. Brutus. They are all welcome. What watchful cares do interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? Here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Oh, pardon, sir, it doth, and yon grey lines that fret the clouds are messengers of day. Give me your hands all over, one by one. And let us swear our resolution. Shall no man else be touched, but only Caesar? Decius, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver, and you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Which, to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself. Take thought and die for Caesar, and that were much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. Beast, count the clock. The clock has stricken three. It is time to part. We leave you, Brutus. And friends, disperse yourselves. But all remember what you have said, and show yourselves true Romans. Good gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes. But bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. And so, good morrow to you, everyone. Good morrow, good morrow. Good morrow. Caesar has also passed a restless night. Nor heaven nor earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help, ho, they murder Caesar. Who's within? My lord. Go, bid the priests do present sacrifice and bring me their opinions of success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threatened me ne'er looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lions hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fight upon the clouds, in ranks and squadrons and right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth. 
For these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to be most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Now, what say the augurates? They would not have you to stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. The gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I the elder and more terrible. And Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate House, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. <laughs> Mark Antony shall say I am not well, and for thy humour I will stay at home. Here's Decius Brutus, he shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greeting to the senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false, and that I dare not, falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquests stretched mine arms so far to be afeard to tell greybeards the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with an hundred spouts, did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent. And on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes in which so many smiling Romans bathed signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. And this way have you well expounded it. I have, when you have heard what I can say. And know it now. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word, you will not come. Their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, Lo, oh, Caesar is afraid. Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia. I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. And look, where Publius is come to fetch me. Good morrow, Caesar. Welcome, Publius. What, Brutus? Are you stirred so early too? Good morrow, Casca. Caius Ligarius, Caesar was ne'er so much your enemy as that same ague which hath made you lean. <laughs> what is the clock? Caesar, it is struck an eight. I thank you for your pains and courtesy. See, Antony that revels long o' nights is notwithstanding up. Good morrow, Antony. So too, most noble Caesar. Bid them prepare within. I am to blame to be thus waited for. Now, sinner, now Metellus. What, Trebonius? I have an hour's talk in store for you. Remember that you call on me today. Be near me that I may remember you. Caesar, I will. And so near will I be that your best friend shall wish I had been further. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me. And we, like friends, will straightway go together. Caesar, having brushed aside Calpurnia's fears, goes to the Senate. Uh, <laughs> the Ides of March are come. Aye, Caesar, but not God. Where is Metellus Simba? 
Let him go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Castle, you are the first that raise your hand. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, and most puissant Caesar, Metellus Simba throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simba. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn pre-ordinance and first decree into the law of children. Be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the true quality with that which melteth fools. I mean sweet words, low crooked curtsies, and base spaniel fawning. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simba may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar. Caesar, pardon. As low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks, they all, and every one doth shine. But there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world. It is furnished well with men, and men are flesh and blood and apprehensive. Yet, in the number, I do know but one that unassailable holds on his rank unshaked of motion, and that I am he, let me a little show it, even in this, that I was constant, Simba should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. Oh, Caesar! Hence wilt thou lift up Olympus! Great Caesar! Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak hands on me! Ah! Oh! <laughs> Fall, Caesar. Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Run hence, oh, proclaim, cry by the streets. Come to the common pulpits and cry out, liberty, freedom, and enfranchisement. People and senators, be not affrighted. Cry not, stand still. Ambition's debt is paid. But here comes Anthony. Let me pass. Welcome, Mark Anthony. Conquest, glories, triumphs, spoils, shrunk to this little measure. Fare thee well. Let each man render me his bloody hand. Friends, I am with you all and love you all. Upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And am moreover suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace, and in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Do you know how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon, I will myself into the pulpit first, and show the reason of our Caesar's death. What Antony shall speak, I will protest, he speaks by leave and by permission. And that we are contented, Caesar shall have true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage more than do us wrong. I know not what may all I like it not. Mark Antony, here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar, and say you do it by our permission, else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going, after my speech is ended. Be it so, I do desire no more. Prepare the body then, and follow us. Oh. Pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy 
which like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with custom of fell deeds and Caesar's spirit raging for revenge with Arty by his side come hot from hell shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrier and men groaning for burial. I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Oh, yeah. Had you rather that Caesar were living and die all slaves, oh. and that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so vile that will not love his country? If any speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. Then, Then none have I offended. Here comes his body. Warned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. <laughs> Let me depart alone, and for my sake stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse, and grace his speech tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoken. You gentle Romans! Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them, but good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, aye, so are aye. they all, all honorable men. 
come I to speak in Caesar's funeral? He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause. There's not a nobler man in Rome. But he begins again to speak. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament. Which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. It is good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? Read the will. We'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will. Caesar is patient. Will you stay a while? I have all shut myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. The will. The will. The will. will compel me then to read the will? Aye. Aye. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend and will you give me leave? I come on. Room for Antony, most noble Antony. Press not so upon me. Stand far off. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent, the day he overcame the Novii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved, if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no, for Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I, and you, and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep. And I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors. He will be revenged. Revenge! Revenge! Stay 
countrymen. He's dead. Yeah, the noble Anthony. We'll hear him. We'll follow him. We'll die with him. Aye. Aye. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honorable, and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man. But love my friend, and that they knew full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Poor, poor dumb mouths and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Return the house of Brutus. Away then, come, see the conspirators. Yet hear me, countrymen. Yet hear me speak. My friends, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not, I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Where is the will? And under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. Oh, most noble Caesar. We revenge his death. Royal Caesar. Hear me with patience. Peace. Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. He hath left them you and to your heirs forever. Common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such a number? Never, never. Come away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place. And when the brands fire the traitor's houses, take up the body. Go! Uh, open fire! Uh, Lock down benches! Lock down floors! The windows! Mischief thou art afoot, take thou what course thou wilt. How now, fellow? Sir, Octavius is already come to Rome. Where is he? He and Lepidus are at Caesar's house. And thither will I straight to visit him. He comes upon a wish. Fortune is merry, and in this mood will give us anything. I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. Belike they had some notice of the people, how I had moved them. Bring me to Octavius. Brutus and Cassius flee from Rome and raise a rebel army. Come in, Titinius. Welcome, good Masala. Now sit we close about this taper here and call in question our necessities. Masala, I have here received letters that young Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the self same tenor. What do you think, Cassius, of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it good. Your reason? This it is. It is better that the enemy seek us. So shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offence, whilst we lying still are full of rest, defence and nimbleness. Good reasons must of force give place to better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand but in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up. Come on, refresh, new added and encouraged. From which advantage shall we cut him off? If at Philippi we do face him there, these people at our back. Hear me, good brother. Under your pardon. You must note beside that we have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful. Our cause is ripe. The enemy increaseth every day. We at the height are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. 
Such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. Then, with your will, go on. We'll along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. The deep of night has crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will niggard with a little rest. There is no more to say. No more. Good night. Early tomorrow will we rise and hence. Lucius, my gown. Farewell, good Messala. Good night, Titinius. Noble, noble Cassius, good night and good repose. Good night, my lord. Good night, good brother. Good night, good night lord Lucius. Farewell, everyone. Brutus goes to bed but cannot sleep. How ill this taper burns. Ah, who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood cold, my hair to stare? Speak to me. What thou art? Thy evil spirit, Brutus. Why comest thou? To tell thee thou shalt see me at Philippa. Well, then I shall see thee again. I at Philippi. I, I will see thee at Philippi then. Now I have taken heart, thou vanishest. Ill spirit, I would hold more talk with thee. Boy, Lucius. Arrow, Claudius, sirs, awake. Why did you so cry out, sirs, in your sleep? Here we are. Aye. Saw you anything? No, my lord, I saw nothing. Nor I, my lord. Go and commend me to my brother Cassius. Bid him set on his powers betimes before. And we will follow. It shall be done, my lord. The rival generals meet at Philippi. On the one side, Brutus and Cassius and on the other, Octavius Caesar and Mark Antony. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar, we will answer on their charge. Make forth, the generals would have some words. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. Words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, Long live, hail, Caesar. Antony, the posture of your blows are yet unknown. But for your words, they rob the Hybler bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless, too? Oh, yes. And soundless, too. For you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Virens, you did not so when your vile daggers hacked one another in the sides of Caesar. You showed your teeth like apes and fawned like hounds and bowed like bondmen, kissing Caesar's feet, whilst damned Casca, like a cur behind, struck Caesar on the neck. Oh, you flatterers. Flatterers? Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today if Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. If arguing make us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you that the sword goes up again? Never till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou brings them with thee. So I hope. I was not born to die on Brutus' sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honourable. A peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honour, joined with a masker and a reveller. Old Cassius still? Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs... Why now, blow wind, swell billow and swim bark. The storm is up. And all is on the hazard. Miss Allah. What says my general? 
Masala, this is my birthday. As this very day was Cassius born. Give me thy hand, Masala. Be thou my witness that against my will, as Pompey was, am I compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. Coming from Sardis, on our former ensign, two mighty eagles fell. And there they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands, who to Philippi here consorted us. This morning they are fled away and gone, and in their steads do ravens, crows and kites fly o'er our heads, and down would look on us as we were sickly prey. Their shadows seem a canopy most fatal under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. I but believe it partly, for I am fresh of spirit and resolved to meet all perils very constantly. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly, that we may lovers in peace lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together. What are you then determined to do? Even by the rule of that philosophy by which I did blame Cato for the death which he did give himself. I know not how, but I do find it cowardly and vile, for fear of what might fall, so to prevent the time of life, arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers that govern us below. And then if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made. Forever and forever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, tis true, this parting was well made. Why right then, lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth that the day will end, and then the end is known. Come, ho! Away! This hill is far enough. Look, look, Titinius, are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Titinius, if thou lovest me, mount thou my horse and hide thy spurs in it, till he have brought thee up to yonder troops and here again, that I may rest assured whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a thought. Go, Pindarus, get higher on that hill, my sight was ever thick. Regard Titinius and tell me what thou notest about the field. This day I breathe it first. Time is come round, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Sirrah, what news? Oh, my lord. What news? Titinius is enclosed round about with horsemen that make to him on the spur, yet he spurs on. Now they are almost on him. Now, Titinius, now some light. Oh, he lights too. He stands. They shout for joy. Come down, behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long to see my best friend tamed before my face. Come hither, Pindarus. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner, and then I swore thee, saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath. Now be a free man, and with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels, search this bosom. No, my lord, no. Stand not to answer. Here, take thou the hilts. And when my face is covered, as it is now, guide thou the sword. Oh! 
Caesar, thou art revenged, even with the sword that killed me. Where, where, Masala, does his body lie? No, Brutus, Titinia's mourning it. Titinia's face is upward. He is slain. O oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Fly, fly, my lord, there is no tarrying here. Farewell to you, and you, and you, Volumnius. Strato, there has been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee, too, Strato. Countrymen, my heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day, more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence, I will follow. I prithee, Strato, stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some snatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword and turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, Strato? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good Strato. <sighs> Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man.